An initial public offering is a company's first sale of securities to the public. This is the point at which a private company becomes a publicly listed company. The initial offer of securities to the public is also referred to as the primary market for securities. The trading of shares on the exchange after the stock becomes listed, that is the trading on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ or the Australian Stock Securities Exchange, is referred to as the secondary market. Companies engage in IPOs for many reasons. For example, an IPO allows the company to raise new equity capital for investment, it allows the former owners to sell some or all of their investment, and it provides liquidity for the shares, so that they are more attractive to investors if the company wishes to raise new capital in the future. In many instances, companies do not sell all of their shares in the IPO. They might only sell 10% of the shares to the public, or they might sell 100% of the shares to the public. There are two main reasons to sell less than 100% of shares in the IPO. First, the potential buyers of shares in the IPO are more likely to buy shares if they know the original owners of the company still have some exposure to the company's performance. In other words, the potential buyers like to see the former owners have some skin in the game. If the former owners sell out completely, potential buyers can form the perception that the sellers are leaving when the company is at its peak. Second, the former owners do not necessarily need to raise new capital right now. They might just want to have the shares listed to reduce uncertainty about the fair value for the shares. When securities are not traded, there is a high degree of uncertainty about what is the market value of those securities. But once shares are trading on an exchange, most of this uncertainty is resolved. So if the company anticipates needing to raise equity in the future, it might list a fraction of the company on the exchange today to reduce investor uncertainty about market value. To provide some perspective on the size of the IPO market, over the 22 year period from 1980 to 2001, there were around 6,000 IPOs in the United States, which raised $500 billion in real 2001 dollars. This represents equity raise of around $22 billion per year from an average issue size of $78 million. Over the 12 year period from January 1999 to 2010, there were around 1,300 IPOs in Australia, which raised $48 billion in nominal dollars. This represents equity raised of around $5 billion per year from an average issue size of $37 million. The data shows that the typical IPO is for a relatively small amount. The average IPO raises less than $100 million. But there is a great deal of dispersion in the size of the offering and the types of firms that list their shares on the exchange the capital raised, and the performance of shares after listing. This is illustrated with three recent IPOs from the United States, as described in Table 1. The performance of the shares subsequent to listing is interesting. Across the three offers, there is a dispersion of performance both in the short term and the long term. The typical IPO has an unusual return on the first day. The first day return is the percentage difference in the price investors are prepared to pay for the stock when it is trading on the exchange, versus the price investors are prepared to pay for the stock in the IPO. You will see that in two of the three offers, the first day closing price is around 30% above the IPO price. The average return on this first day of trade is around 19%. In this lecture, we will discuss some explanations for why investors are prepared to pay such different prices for the same share just one day apart. Across the three stocks, there is a divergence of performance in the long term. Over the 10 years since listing, Cabelos has provided investors with returns of around 10% per year. This is the return an investor would have received if the investor had bought the shares at $26.52 on the market at the end of the first day's trade. But had investors sold just a few years earlier in 2010, their total returns would have been minus 8% per year. Symmetry Medical Shares performed equally poorly until 2010, providing shareholders with returns of minus 11% since, since listing. Unfortunately for Symmetry Medical shareholders, the share price never recovered. Shareholders since listing have only earned returns of minus 7% per year. Shareholders in Foundation Coal Holdings experienced highly volatile returns. Over the first five years since listing, things went particularly well because the company was acquired by Alpha Natural Resources. Shareholders in Foundation Coal received 1.084 Alpha shares 
for each Foundation coal share they owned. On July 31, 2009, when the deal was finalised, shares in Alpha were trading at $33.31 per share. So if you had owned one share in Foundation Coal and exchanged this for 1.084 Alpha shares, your wealth would be $36.11. This represents a return of 11% per year. But if you had held on to the Alpha shares until January 28, 2014, all these gains would have been eroded. One share in Alpha is now worth $5.84, and so 1.084 Alpha shares are worth $6.33. By holding on for nine years, your return would have been minus 13% per year. Why do firms list on the stock exchange? We're gonna consider liquidity versus disclosure and cost considerations. Firms list on the stock exchange because liquidity is considered highly valuable for equity investors. In a subsequent class on private firms, we discuss the valuation discount between publicly traded stock and private companies. Value is around, generally around 10 to 30% lower for private companies compared to publicly traded companies. If you hold stock in a non-traded company, you are exposed to an additional layer of risk. The risk that you cannot exit your investment at the time of your choosing. You might need to sell at a lower price because there are less investors who can purchase your shares. In many cases, you will be restricted to only selling the shares to other current shareholders. Listing on the stock exchange also means that your stock could be covered by equity analysts who provide information to investors. And we know that the more information available to investors, the more they will be willing to consider an investment. Finally, there will be institutional investors who will be restricted by their own rules or regulations imposed by government who could only buy shares in publicly traded companies. However, listing has some downsides. First, by selling shares to the public, the firm is required to make additional disclosures which provides valuable information to competitors. We do not go into the specific rules relating to listing, but the general principle is that firms are required to disclose price sensitive information to the market on a timely basis. So if management has information which it believes would alter investor expectations of future cash flows and risk, and which therefore is likely to affect the stock price, this needs to be disclosed. Second, there are the direct compliance costs of listing. This includes fees payable to the exchange, auditing fees, publicly traded firms must have audited financial statements, and costs of complying with rules imposed by the exchange and regulators like the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. Third, there is an argument that being a publicly traded firm distracts management from making valuable long-term investment decisions because management becomes overly focused on maximising today's stock price. It is true that managers have the perception that the stock price is determined by near-term earnings. In a survey of chief financial officers, a majority of respondents stated that they would reject a positive net present value project if it meant the firm's earnings per share would fall short of analyst forecasts. So it seems that managers perceive that the market is overly fixated on near-term earnings. This perception does not give the market much credit and is not consistent with the data. Market prices do react to earnings results. Share prices rise when companies announce earnings above expectations, and share prices fall when companies announce earnings below expectations. But this stock price reaction occurs because companies miss earnings targets associated with poor performance of existing assets. Not because the market can't work out that a good investment will generate higher cash flows later. The point is that managers who run publicly listed firms that only care about maximising short-term earnings rather than investing in positive net present value projects will ultimately make poor investment choices. Ultimately, the net present value of investments will be reflected in the stock price, even if you believe that the market will take a little time to fully understand the economic benefits of the project. So being publicly listed does not force a company manager to only care about near-term earnings, this only occurs if the manager has the misplaced perception that the market can't simply understand earnings outside of a short-term window. Next, let's mention life cycle theories. The life cycle theory for choosing to have an IPO is basically a trade-off between the benefits and costs mentioned above. Once a firm reaches a particular stage in its life cycle, the benefits can outweigh the costs. For small firms, it is optimal to raise money from private investors 
because going public is expensive and requires the disclosure of proprietary information, which as we mentioned, competitors can take advantage of. However, private investors typically require higher rates of return on their investment because of the lack of liquidity and the fact that they typically hold undiversified portfolios. Hence, once the firm becomes sufficiently large, it is optimal to raise money in the public market. The benefits, a lower cost of capital, outweigh the costs, compliance and disclosure costs, once the firm reaches a certain size. It's also worth mentioning market timing theories. The market timing theory as to why firms undertake IPOs is the notion that entrepreneurs and venture capitalists try to time the market by selling stock when valuations are high and delaying IPOs when valuations are low. There is some empirical support for this notion, given that in the long term, companies that issue new equity seem to have worse share price performance than other companies. Long term performance is discussed later. But this long term performance does not really tell us that managers have skill in timing the market. If managers knew when the market was at its peak, they would sell their own shares at the time of the IPO, and they would have the company sell more shares to the public. But it seems that managers do not sell their own shares at the time of the IPO. So the reason for the long-term underperformance of stocks going public is driven by both managers and investors being optimistic at the same time. We cannot cover IPOs without some mention of the unusual IPO market of 1999 and 2000, which coincided with the technology boom. During this period, there was a fundamental shift in the composition of firms undertaking IPOs. Consider the following facts. From 1980 to 2001, 34% of newly listed firms had negative earnings and 35% were technology stocks. But in the period 1999 to 2000, 79% of firms which went public had negative earnings and 72% were technology stocks. Think about this carefully. In a two year period, investors were prepared to buy stock in firms in which four out of five companies were losing money. To give you an idea how optimistic investors were during this period, the average first day returns on these loss-making firms in 1999 and 2000 was 72%. This means that if you bought a stock in an IPO for a dollar and the company had previously reported negative earnings, the average price of that stock at the end of the first day of trade in the market was $1.72. Investors were climbing over themselves to buy loss-making companies in the expectation of high positive earnings in the future. By contrast, the average first day return of stocks which had reported positive earnings was 44%. So if you had bought a share in an IPO for a dollar and the company was profitable, at the end of the first day, you would expect that stock to trade at $1.44. Once a business has decided to go public, its advisors, typically an investment bank, will make an initial estimate of the value of the shares. The advisors are also called the underwriters. Recall that there are two concepts of value, a market value, which is what investors are prepared to pay for the shares today, and an intrinsic value, which is an estimate of the value based upon the premise that the market is either overly optimistic or pessimistic. For example, suppose you were considering buying an apartment on sale for $400,000 and wanted to know whether this offer price is comparable to other similar apartments. You could compile some transaction prices for apartments in the same area of similar size and quality, and use this information to estimate the fair market value of the apartment you are considering buying. Alternatively, you could form a more fundamental or intrinsic estimate of value under the presumption that apartment buyers today are paying too much or too little for apartments. If you thought interest rates were going to fall, you might estimate the intrinsic value of the apartment at $500,000 because when finance becomes cheaper, people are prepared to pay more for real estate. They can afford the repayments because of the lower interest rates. The value estimate compiled by the advisors in an IPO is equivalent to the first situation. All the advisors are engaged to do is facilitate a transaction. A company wants to sell shares to investors in the public market, and investors want to buy those shares. So the advisor's initial estimate of value is their best estimate as to what investors will pay for the shares. The advisors in the IPO are not engaged to tell investors whether they think the shares are overpriced or underpriced, according to their view on intrinsic value. That is the role of equity analysts who make buy and sell recommendations, and active fund managers who try to earn abnormal returns relative to a benchmark. Note that the advisor's initial valuation will not be the price that investors will pay in the IPO. 
The valuation is just an estimate of value used to begin a negotiation. The advisors will provide investors with written information in the form of a prospectus and meet with investors and use information provided by investors to arrive at a final offer price. We will discuss the final offer price a little later. To make an estimate of value, the advisors refer to prices paid for shares of similar companies that are already trading. The most common valuation technique for an IPO is a multiples-based valuation. In this valuation technique, we compile a set of market values, either for the entire firm, debt plus equity, or a value for just the equity, and then divide value by a measure of earnings or cash flow. This provides a valuation multiple. For instance, suppose a firm had equity value, that is share price times number of shares, of $100 million, debt value of $20 million, and earnings before interest and tax of $15 million. The value of the firm, debt plus equity, is $120 million, which is eight times earnings of $15 million. So the value to EBIT multiple is eight times. You can compile ratios of value to sales, value to EBITDA, value to EBIT, and you can compile, you can compile multiples of equity to pre-tax profit and equity to net profit after tax. For equity, this can also be done on a per share basis by dividing equity in the earnings figure by the number of shares. Continuing with the example, suppose there are 50 million shares on issue and net profit after tax is $100 million. This means that the share price is $2, equity value of $100 million divided by 50 million shares is two bucks, and earnings per share is 20 cents. $10 million of net profit after tax divided by 50 million shares is 20 cents of earnings per share. So we say that the price earnings ratio is 10 times. Price per share divided by earnings per share is $2 divided by 20 cents or 10. The idea is that you can compile a set of valuation multiples for similar firms to the firm you are trying to value and apply those multiples to the earnings or cash flow for the firm you are trying to value. With reference to the example above, suppose that your firm has EBIT of $6 million. If you apply the value to EBIT multiple of eight <coughs> times from comparable firms, the estimate of enterprise value is $48 million, $6 million of earnings before interest and tax times eight times value to EBIT is $48 million. If you had $4 million debt in your firm, the resulting estimate of equity value would be $44 million. You could make another estimate of value by considering the ratio of equity relative to net profit after tax. If your firm has net profit after tax of $5 million and you apply the equity to net profit after tax ratio of 10 times to this earnings figure, your estimate of equity value will be $50 million. And if you add back in the value of debt, the value of the entire firm as an enterprise would be $54 million. So in this example, you have two estimates of value for the entire firm, $44 million and $54 million, and two estimates of equity value, $40 million and $50 million. I suggest that you minimize estimation error by taking an average value estimate from all your valuation estimates, which is illustrated in the forthcoming example. Importantly, you cannot compile a multiple by mixing up firm value versus equity value in the numerator and denominator of the multiple. In the multiples listed earlier, we had three proxies for earnings or cash flow relating to the firm. Sales, EBITDA, and EBIT. The appropriate numerator is the value of the entire firm, that is business value or enterprise value, because the earnings will eventually be used to make payments to both the debt and the equity holders. We had another two proxies for earnings or cash flow that only relate to equity, that is pre-tax profit and net profit after tax. The appropriate numerator in this case is equity value because the earnings will be used eventually to make payments only to equity holders. The debt holders have already been paid their interest payments before we get to pre-tax profit and net profit after tax. We will illustrate the valuation concept with a detailed example. Suppose the business we were going to value is a fast food restaurant. We compile a set of fast food companies listed in the United States, and that data appears in Table 2. It's actual information from April 2011, previously used to value a fast food company. In the upper section of the table, we have a compilation of the market value of equity, debt, and historical and forecast information for sales, EBITDA, and EBIT. 
There are two years of forecasts, but forecasts are not available for every company over two years. In the lower section of the table, we have valuation multiples. As one specific example, consider Domino's Pizza. Domino's had a share price of $18.57 and 61.7 million shares in issue. So its equity value, or market capitalization, is $1,145 million. $18.57 times 61.7 million shares is $1,145 million. Domino's had debt of $1.45 billion, so the total value of the entire firm is $2.6 billion. Domino's has forecast EBITDA in year one of $265 million, so Domino's value to EBITDA multiple is 9.8 for the first forecast year. In the last row of the table, I present the nine median valuation multiples. We have median multiples for sales of 1.7, 1.6 and 1.7, with respect to historical sales and forecast sales in years one and two. The corresponding median value to EBITDA multiples are 10.3, 9.3 and 8.9, and the corresponding value to EBIT multiples are 12.7, 12.6 and 12.2. Now suppose the fast food company we are trying to value has the following financial information. This information is summarized in table three along with some other information. Sales last year was $1,200 million and it's forecast to be $1,300 million next year and $1,400 million in two years. EBITDA last year was $190 million and it's forecast to be $210 million next year and $230 million in two years. EBIT last year was $140 million and it's forecast to be $180 million next year and $210 million in two years. Debt is $250 million. There will be 100 million shares on issue after the company is listed. Now we are in a position to estimate equity value per share as the first stage of the IPO process. We will actually compile nine possible estimates of value because we have nine median valuation multiples. Consider the first median valuation multiple of 1.7 times historical sales. The historical sales of the fast food company is $1,200 million. So our estimate of firm value is $1,984 million. 1.7 times $1,200 million is $1,984 million. To estimate the value of equity, we need to subtract the $250 million worth of debt. So equity value is estimated at $1,734 million. There were 100 million shares in issue, so the estimate of equity value per share is $17.34. If you repeat this process using all valuation multiples available to us, the range of valuation estimates is $15.33 to $23.20 per share. I have taken an average estimate of $18.67 as an estimate of equity value per share. Which multiple is best? In my view, you should use all valuation multiples for analysis. Value to sales, value to EBITDA, value to EBIT, equity to pre-tax profit, and equity to net profit after tax. The reason for this is that as you move further down the income statement towards net profit after tax, the measure of earnings is more relevant for equity holders. But it is also estimated with less precision because there are more distortions due to accounting issues. As you move further up the income statement towards sales, the measure of earnings is less relevant because there is less information about costs factored in, but the measure is more reliable. In practice, there will be extensive debate about which is the right valuation multiple to use in a particular situation. But if you perform a valuation for the same company over time, or see how close valuation estimates get to transaction prices, in general, you will minimize estimation error by using more information. Should we use historical or forecast earnings? In general, multiples based upon forecast earnings will provide better estimates of value because forecast earnings are not affected by unusual events that impact upon historical earnings. You just need to be mindful of the risk of optimism on the part of management earnings forecasts. Analyst earnings forecasts are generally unbiased. That is the median difference between analyst earnings forecast and realized earnings is about zero. But on average, analysts appear optimistic the reason the average forecast appears optimistic relative to realized earnings is because there are some large one-off events that lead to disappointing earnings 
But this is not offset by large one-off positive surprises. So even if an analyst's median forecast is about equal to actual earnings most of the time, the average forecast can be optimistic. Let's consider marketing and pricing the issue. Having compiled an initial valuation and prepared as prospectus, the IPO is marketed to institutional investors. This marketing program is called a roadshow. It is used to arrive at a final offer price and allocate shares to clients. Retail investors are also allocated shares, but they may receive a group presentation from their stockbroking firm or merely apply for shares without a presentation. Retail investors do not participate in the book building process that we're about to describe, so they do not get to specify a particular price they are prepared to pay. But retail investors are often offered a small discount, perhaps 5%, to the price paid by institutional investors. So basically the offer price is set by institutions and retail investors are sometimes given a discount because they do not have any say in the price they will ultimately pay for the shares. The issue process is summarised in a diagram. In theory, the book billing process, the process used to set the final offer price, works like this. Institutional investors state the number of shares they are prepared to buy and the price they are prepared to pay for the shares. This is called a limit order. So for instance, one investor offers to buy 2.9 million shares for $20 per share. Another investor offers to buy 8.6 million shares for $19.90 and so on. The advisors take the highest bids and work down towards the lowest bids until they have allocated all the shares. The bids made by the institutional investors in this example are illustrated in Table 4. You will see in the table that 100 million shares will be allocated if the offer price is set at $19.40 per share. This will be the price paid by all institutional investors in the IPO, even if they have bid a higher price. So in theory, the advisors would pick the price to shares at $19.40 per share and raise equity of $1,940 million. In theory, allocations would also be made to the investors who bid the highest prices. But in reality, the allocation process is not as clean as this. First, the offer price will, on average, be set below the price of $19.40 indicated by market demand. The main reason this occurs is that the advisors want to minimise the risk that investors suffer a loss on the first day of trade when more information is factored into market prices. We consider this issue in more detail in a subsequent session. On average, advisors will discount the offer price by around 15%. So in our example, the offer price might be set at $16.50 or $16. Second, the allocation does not proceed simply according to investors who make the highest bids. Advisors have discretion in the allocation process and award shares to their preferred clients. And the company selling shares has influence over who is allocated shares. Third, there is the discretion to allocate more shares than initially anticipated. So there could be more than 100 million shares issued. Once the shares begin trading, there is generally very high trading volume on the first day of trade. In the event that the share price begins to fall, the advisors are able to trade in order to stabilise the price. In short, the underwriters can buy shares to support the share price. The normal provisions in the market against market manipulation do not apply. It has never been clear to me why this aftermarket support is important, because it can only artificially support the share price for a short period of time. The underwriters can only hope to buy shares and support the share price for a few days, in the hope that market expectations improve and the share price remains high once the underwriters sell. So the case for aftermarket stabilisation relies upon the idea that if the share price is kept high because of artificial demand, the underwriters are buying shares that they do not actually want, this will somehow keep the share price high later. This could only work if the market naively looks at the share price in the first few days and thinks, yes, I think that is a baseline for the fair price for the stock. But there is no reason to think that the market is so naive. Investors are likely to price the stock on the basis of its expected earnings, not on the basis of a price it happened to observe in the few days after listing. The underwriting firm will typically have an analyst provide research coverage of the IPOs they have been involved in. The idea is that research coverage reduces the information gap between the firm and investors, which may reduce the cost of capital for the stock 
and subsequently result in price appreciation. This is a reasonable argument and is supported by theory and evidence that prices are high if information gaps amongst investors and between companies and investors are reduced. Finally, let's consider stock returns subsequent to listing, beginning with short-term performance. IPOs on average are underpriced. This means that the advisors price the stocks below what the market is prepared to pay. We measure the extent of underpricing by computing the difference in price between the first day closing price and the offer price set in the IPO. For example, suppose our fast food company is priced at $16.50 per share and the closing price at the end of the first day is $18. The percentage difference in prices is 9%. $18 on $16.50 minus one is 9%. From 1980 to 2001, the average first day return on US listed IPOs was 19%. This represents $106 billion of money left on the table. The difference between actual IPO proceeds and what you would, would have received if the issues were priced at their first day closing price. During the period of 1999 and 2000, this first day price change rose to an average of 65%. From 1960 to 1979, the average first day return was 17%, implying that IPO underpricing is in no way a recent phenomenon. It's also a global phenomenon. In Australia, from January to 2000, 1999 to August 2010, the average first day return on Australian listed IPOs was 23%. The median was 8%. In addition, 63% of shares increased in price on the first day and 29% fell in price, with 8% closing at a price equal to their offer price. Hence, for a very long period of time and in different markets, underwriters have sold shares for prices below what investors are prepared to pay. This occurs now, even though advisors have a good indication of market demand via the book building process. The underwriters sell a stock in the IPO for a dollar, and the next day can be bought in the market for, on average, a dollar 19, the 19% first day return. Why isn't this share sold for a dollar 19 in the IPO? There are four reasons for this, as discussed below. First of all, underwriters and companies choose to leave money on the table to minimise their risk. This first reason is to prevent the risk of loss for the investment bank. The underwriter wants to minimise the chance that the IPO does not proceed at the last moment or the underwriter needs to buy shares itself at a high price. There are two main types of underwriting agreement, a best efforts underwriting agreement and a firm commitment agreement. Under the best efforts agreement, the underwriter agrees to try very hard to sell the shares to the public, but is not obligated to buy any shares itself. This is a low risk option for the underwriter. But even though the underwriter is not obligated to buy shares itself, the underwriter normally will not get paid unless the IPO is completed. Underwriters receive most of their compensation as a success fee. So the underwriter wants to increase the chance of receiving the success fee by lowering the offer price. The second sort of underwriting agreement is a firm commitment agreement, under which the underwriter agrees to buy shares that investors did not want. In a firm commitment agreement, the underwriter is exposed to substantial risk. If the offer is priced too high, there is the risk that the underwriter will need to buy shares and then sell them in a market of weak demand once the shares begin trading. So the underwriter wants to minimise the chance of buying shares at a high price and then selling them for a loss. This explanation can only hold if one of two things happen. One possibility is that underwriters do not compete against each other on the basis of trying to maximise the offer price. Company executives know that IPOs are normally underpriced. So in a competitive market, they could shop the IPO around amongst underwriters until they found an underwriter prepared to sell the price at the highest possible level. This doesn't occur, so maybe all the underwriters leave some money on the table in setting the offer price. The second possibility is that company executives are complicit in leaving money on the table because they also want to minimise the chance that the share price falls on the first day of trade. Recall that often a fraction of company shares are sold in the IPO, which means that the company might go to the equity market again in the next couple of years to issue more shares. This will be slightly more difficult if you sell overpriced shares to investors in the IPO. 
They will remember the disappointing first day returns from the IPO and be less willing to buy shares in a season equity offering. Remember that setting the offer price is all about estimation error and its consequences. We do not know for certain what the market price will be once shares begin trading. We only have an estimate of price from the book building process. So the underwriters and company executives are making a judgment on the consequences of making a mistake in setting the offer price too low. The consequence is leaving money on the table. And the consequence of making a mistake in setting the offer price too high is that the IPO either does not go ahead or the share price falls in the first day, leaving underwriters with a loss or some dissatisfied investors who may be asked to provide capital in the future. It is certainly the case that underwriters attempt to minimise their risk, and it is certainly the case that company executives choose to leave money on the table as a result of these consequences. We cannot say which explanation is more important in a particular IPO, but this decision, this strategic choice of the underwriters, is the main reason IPOs are underpriced. We know that this is a strategic choice and not as a result of an accident because of the following empirical evidence. The underwriter estimates a final price from within a range. In our fast food example, this range might be $16 to $20. The underwriters do not need to set the final price from within this range. If the book billing process suggests there is enough demand to set the price at $21, the underwriters are free to go outside the range. But most of the time they stick to a price from within that indicative range. The empirical evidence is that if the final offer price is set at the upper end of the range, on average the shares in that company will go up on the first day. For example, if a price was set the $20 upper bound, we would expect a positive first day return. We also know that if the price is set at the lower end of the range, the evidence is that the share price falls on the first day. This very large sample evidence means that the underwriter decides to set the price at a level, which is different to what is suggested by the book building process. It means the underwriter strategically leaves money on the table. So if the average return is positive on the first day, this can be attributed to a choice by the underwriter to set the price below what the market will pay. As mentioned above, this is not in all circumstances against the best interests of the company. Company executives often agree to this to minimise the risk of subsequent capital raisings. But it remains a choice based upon incentives, and we do not know in a particular situation whether that choice is to aid the underwriter or the company. A second explanation for underpricing is that the underwriters allocate cheap shares to favoured clients, mainly institutional investors but also executives of other companies. This sort of action resulted in an investigation by the Securities and Exchange Commission in which around 10 major firms were subject to heavy penalties and increased regulation. What happened is that the banks allocated cheap IPOs to executives in the hope that when those executives companies held an IPO, the bank would be appointed as the underwriter and generate fees. The third explanation for IPO underpricing is asymmetric information. Asymmetric information refers to an information gap. This information gap can partially explain underpricing, but it's not the main explanation. If there is information asymmetry amongst investors with good information and investors with bad information, there will be IPO underpricing even if underwriters do their very best to sell the shares at the highest possible price. The problem is that uninformed investors face a winner's curse. Everyone knows the average IPO is underpriced, but not all IPOs are underpriced. Around two thirds of IPO stocks rise on the first day of trade, and around one third of IPO stocks fall on the first day of trade. So if you were equally likely to receive an allocation in every IPO, you could make very high returns. The problem is that an uninformed investor can't work out which are the underpriced IPOs and which are the overpriced IPOs. But on average, informed investors, institutions, have some ability to work this out. So the informed investors receive more shares in the cheap IPOs that rise in price on the first day of trade, and uninformed investors, mainly retail investors, receive more shares in expensive IPOs that fall on the first day of trade. 
Now the reason the average IPO ends up underpriced in this situation is because the companies still need retail investors to buy shares in IPOs. If retail investors were driven out of participating in IPOs because they always lose, there will not be enough equity capital raised for new investment. So on average, offer prices need to be set so that retail investors earn at least zero returns on the first day of trade. If this happens and institutional investors earn positive returns on the first day, then the average first day return must also be positive. This can be illustrated with some indicative figures. Suppose the available capital in the market is sourced 30% from retail investors and 70% from institutional investors. There are 100 firms which each need to raise $10 million of capital. Hence, $300 million will be raised from retail investors and $700 million from institutions. Suppose that half the IPOs, raising a total of $500 million, are the cheap IPOs. They will earn returns in the first day of 30%. Institutional investors have better information than retail investors, so they bid for more shares in these cheap IPOs. So in our example, institutions receive $425 million worth of shares, that is 85%, and retail investors receive $75 million worth of shares, or 15%. The other half of the IPOs, also raising a total of $500 million, are the expensive IPOs. They will earn returns in the first day of minus 10%. Many institutions work this out, so bid for fewer of the expensive IPOs. This leaves more IPOs in the hands of retail investors. Institutions receive $275 million worth of shares, 55%, and retail investors receive $225 million worth of shares, or 45%. In this example, we have the following first day returns amongst different investor groups. The average first day return earned by retail investors was zero. Retail investors bought $75 million worth of shares in IPOs, which rose 30%, and bought $225 million in shares in IPOs, which fell by 10%. So the average return across all investments was $75 million times 30%, plus $225 million times minus 10%, divided by $300 million. And on average, that works out to be a 0% return. The average first day return earned by institutional investors was 14%. Institutions bought $425 million worth of shares in IPOs, which rose 30%, and bought $275 million of shares in IPOs, which fell 10%. So the average return across all investments was $425 million times 30%, plus $275 million times minus 10%, and on average that is a positive return of 14%. The average first day return earned by all investors was 10%. Investors bought $500 million worth of shares in IPOs which went up by 30% and $500 million worth of shares in IPOs which fell by 10%. So the average return across all investments was $500 million times 30% plus $500 million times minus 10% on a base of a billion dollars. And on average that's 10%. The point is that in this example, retail investors on average didn't lose. They had enough incentive to keep participating in the IPO process. But this also means that the average IPO is cheap because the uninformed investors receive relatively more shares in the expensive IPOs. The implication is that so long as the same group of uninformed investors is needed for capital, IPOs will be priced below fair value. The final explanation for IPO underpricing is the market feedback hypothesis. The idea behind this explanation for IPO underpricing is that underwriters leave some money on the table to encourage investors to provide reliable information about what they think the stock is worth. The issuing companies and their advisors may be very well informed about the earnings prospects of the company and potential investments, but they might be quite uninformed about the market value of the company. The book building process is a chance to elicit information from the market about value. Recall that in the book building process, the bankers basically say, how many shares do you want to purchase and what price are you prepared to pay? Suppose that following the book building process, the advisors set the price as high as possible. So as a result of investors telling the advisors what they think is a fair price, 
they end up paying the highest possible price in the IPO. If you were an investor who experienced this scenario, what would your response be in the next IPO? Would you provide a realistic indication of what you thought an appropriate value was? Unlikely. After all, the more information you provide to the banker about the appropriate price, the more likely the advisor will raise the price to full value. Your incentive is not to be truthful about what you think is fair value. So here is the equilibrium outcome. The advisors leave some money on the table, which provides investors with a reward for being truthful in their estimate of fair value. When the advisor and investor interact again in the next IPO, the investor will continue to be truthful in anticipation of an underpriced IPO. This means that across all companies, they might actually raise more capital in the long run by leaving money on the table. They get better information from investors about fair value. And we know that the more information available for valuation, the higher prices we observe on average. The key point though is that the primary reason why IPOs are underpriced is that investment bankers choose to strategically leave money in the table. The other explanations that we mentioned were relevant, asymmetric information, the market feedback hypothesis and so on. But the main reason for IPO underpricing is investment bankers deliberately leaving money on the table in order to minimise the risk that the IPO does not go ahead. Finally, let's consider long-term performance. In contrast to first-day returns, the long-term performance of IPOs is that they earn lower returns than the broader market. Over three years subsequent to listing, the average IPO underperforms the aggregate stock market by 23.4%. Hence, this over however, this overstates the risk-adjusted performance. If we benchmark performance against a set of firms with comparable market capitalization and book-to-market ratio, variables which have been shown to be very good at explaining stock returns, the average three-year underperformance is 5.1%, which is around 2% per year. This underperformance of the average IPO is explained by the timing of IPOs. There are more IPOs when the market is at a peak, and so subsequently decline in value. If so, if you invest $100 in IPOs every month, your portfolio will perform about as well as if you invested $100 in a basket of listed companies with about the same size and book to market ratio. Importantly, there is no relationship between the first day return and long term underperformance. Just because a stock rises by a large amount on the first day is no indication it will perform worse over the long term than any other IPOs. We have some idea about which IPOs perform poorly in the long run. It appears that institutions are able to work out which IPOs are more likely to underperform as the more shares which are flipped on the first day, that is purchased in the offer and immediately sold, the worse the long-term performance. So if there is a large proportion of institutional investors selling on the first day, this is a sign that the stock will underperform in the long run. Long run underperformance is concentrated amongst firms with low quality underwriters who make accounting choices which inflate earnings prior to the firm being listed. These are the stocks more heavily marketed to retail investors. Firms which make conservative accounting choices and which are underwritten by high quality underwriters do not exhibit abnormal returns over the three years since listing. In conclusion, companies decide to list on an exchange for liquidity. This also increases information available to equity investors, especially if the stock is covered by equity analysts. This leads to equity being valued high because investors pay higher prices for liquid investments and investments for which there is more publicly available information. The downside of being publicly listed is that information is disclosed to competitors and there is incomplete compliance costs. The pricing of IPOs results from canvassing of demand amongst institutional investors after an indicative valuation is performed. The indicative valuation is usually done using a multiples based valuation, but valuation estimates would be improved with more rigorous consideration of discounted cash flow valuations as well. By using a multiples based valuation entirely and not using a discounted cash flow valuation, we replace explicit assumptions about discount rates and growth prospects with a set of implicit assumptions contained in the share prices of the comparable firm set. 
we would have more reliable valuations if we used market data to try to understand what the appropriate assumptions are for a discounted cash flow valuation. In other words, ask what cash flows, discount rates and growth assumptions would I need to make that are consistent with the multiples I observe. IPOs are on average underpriced. This occurs primarily because advisors and issuing companies choose to leave money on the table. Advisors want to minimise their risk that they need to buy shares that fall on the first day of trade, and company executives want to minimise the risk that shareholders are disappointed by a loss on the first day of trade, because the company might want to raise capital again in the future from the same investors. But even if the advisors and company try to maximise proceeds from the offer, there will still be a small degree of residual underpricing because of information asymmetry amongst investors. The only way uninformed investors will keep buying IPOs if, is if their average returns are at least zero. The informed investors earn positive average returns, so across all IPOs, we will observe average underpricing.